young people, especially young people from disadvantaged backgrounds in that space. I mean, we, we have stories, horror stories of people who are stuck in remand centers. We have horror stories of people who get in trouble and have no information whatsoever on what to do about that scenario that they find themselves in. Now, we have a gentleman who has experience on this. Not only does he have experience, he actually has a passion for this thing, something that really, really pulls at his heartstrings. And he's here with us to share some of the insight that he's been able to gather in his life both on one side and the other of the criminal justice system in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, and maybe in a moment or two, I'd like to introduce Mr. Pete Oko of Crime Sipoa. Crime Sipoa. Welcome, Pete. How are Thank you? Bro. It's good to see you. Fine. Everything okay? Thank good you. to see you. Thank you. You're looking very good. Oh, my, it's tiring. This heat in Nairobi is oh, yeah? crazy. I, I'm yeah, telling you. Thanks, it's, thanks so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Really? Karibu sana. Asante. Now, real quick, I mean, I'm sure people are hearing about this, and they saw on the poster, Crime Sipo, Crime Sipo. Talk to us about that. Where did the dream of Crime Sipo begin? The dream of Crime Sipo, as, as, I mean, Crime Sipo is, a, is an amalgamation of English and Kiswahili. Right. Crime is not cool. Yes. So we, we decided to call it Crime Sipo because the youth actually believe Crime Sipo. Mm -hmm. Crime is not cool. Crime does yes. not pay. Uh, and it came from a vision I had when I was on death row in committee. Right. And that was a couple of years ago. And 75% right. um, of the young people in committee, young, you know, under the age of 35. Wow. And so we had this, this call to start a, a lobby, by the way, because I was on death row on a wrongful conviction. And I wasn't able to move around or move out of the country. But there was this vision that we needed to do something. Right. about the number of young people getting into prison. You know, you know just, just hearing that statistic is shocking. Yeah. 75, over 75% 75 of, of the people in committee maximum prison are young people. Not only committee, across the country, across, wow. you know, across uh, the people impacted by the criminal justice system, so to speak. So those behind bars, of this 56,000 right now in prison, 75% or so are below the age of 35. And this is the, the age when people are at their prime. Most productive, Most productive exactly. and yeah. everything. Yeah. What does that say about our country? What does that say about our societies? What kind of laws are we looking at? I mean, I, I, you can look at the laws. We have very good laws in Kenya. We have a very great constitution, very progressive and everything. But what is the adherence to the law? Mm. I've just been asked right now, um, how come in Kenya we don't have a public defender system? Mm. And I've told the colleague who asked me, in Kenya we have the National Legal Aid Service Act. It's an act of parliament, that, and we have the National Legal Aid Service where people who are disadvantaged, who can't afford legal representation, can actually, be, can actually get legal representation by, paid for by the government. Right. You see, remember the constitution says, if an injustice is likely to occur, mm. then you should have a right to mm. that legal representation. Right. But look at the funding, and I'll just ask the MPs, the parliamentarians right now, mm -hmm. how much money in parliament have you allocated to the National Legal Aid Service? Wow. You know, that's, we, we have to face the issues. We, we, we don't only coddle issues and say, you know, we have this problem. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful constitution, we have wonderful structures, but have our MPs funded those structures to be able to serve this segment of the population that needs the services the most? They're underrepresented. Thank and you. He, here's a question. You know, um, I mean, let's face it, TIK, this is Kenya. Yeah. There's a, there's, there's a concern, and I want you to respond to it. Tell me if, if this is valid. There are people that say justice in Kenya is for those with means or access to means or access to networks that can lobby and fight for them. Is this true? Have you found this to be true in your experience? I mean, to a certain extent. You know, sometimes it's about the optics and also about the perception. Mm -hmm. You could look at, let's just do stats, right? Mm -hmm. Of the people in prison right now, how many are from the high net worth mm -hmm. individual group? Mm -hmm. The normal, ordinary Kenyan is not a purveyor of the kind of corruption cases, for example, mm -hmm. that we've had in the country. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the major prisons today, do you have any of those people who we read about in the newspapers mm -hmm. behind bars? Very I don't want to say it's about the judiciary, it's about the prosecution, that's not for it now. So that's why I'm saying it's about optics. The perception is because when you go there, the real data you'll find are actually people from disadvantaged families. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Number one, because 
uh, one of the key things we've learned, people don't know the law. Mm -hmm. Not only people from disadvantaged families, even people across the board. Across the board. Wow. You know, so if you look at the crimes taking people to our prisons today, mostly they're sexual and gender-based violence kind of crimes. Mm. Yeah, you talk about the highest number of inmates today are in for sexual offenses, mm. rape and defilement. Why is this so? Is, what's the story behind these numbers? Now, I've just come from Thika, mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry. I've just come from Thika where we have that serious case of rape and defilement. Mm -hmm. Defilement is of children below the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll just let guys know, if you're not allowed by law, and you're not supposed to have sex with a minor who's under the age of anyone 18. Anyone under the Anyone age. under the age of 18, you'll be in jail. You'll be in jail. Yeah. Despite what the popular song says. You, you'll hear the songs. Don't, forget, don't, don't listen to those songs. Because some of those songs glorify mm. the things that actually land these very people, glorify them in jail. Mm. So if we are just singing some songs, and, and for you, it's nice you brought it. It's unfortunate that there's some songs that glorify rape. Mm -hmm. There are songs that glorify defilement. There are songs that glorify drug consumption. There are songs that glorify um, the negative vices, like, you know, get rich by any means possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if that's the culture we are bringing, we are building today, and we hope to have a country in five years, we are totally lost. We've lost it. Now, I imagine when you're talking to people, young people particularly, about crime sipoa, um, you would share your own story. I want you to talk to me and talk to our viewers about the impact of incarceration, being in prison, to a young person. Um, if I follow your story correctly, you went to prison at around the age of, was it 28 or 29? Yeah, 28. Now, the people you're talking about, the people who, for example, are having sex with underage people, probably because they don't know the law or for many other reasons, they're young people. They're also old people who can pay off. And they're, uh, ha, <laughs> right. So talk to me about what prison does for a young mind to a young person? And are we actually rehabilitating, as the slogan says, or are we actually um, just sending people down a path of no return? Now, one thing I'd like to say is that I'm not here to speak for any government, right. uh, body or any person, anybody, mm -hmm. but I'll speak about experiences. Please. When I went to prison in 1998, mm -hmm. it was torture and punishment. You know, I saw torture, I saw punishment. Come 2003, when Uncle Modi came on board, mm -hmm. and God bless him, I mean, one yeah, of the Moody greatest Awari, careers ever. Wherever you, know, you are, you're a hero. And the late President Kibaki. Right. When, when President Kibaki passed on, I remember Modi Awari sharing this story with the country and saying, you know, I was given instructions by my boss mm -hmm. that I had to do this. Mm -hmm. So it was a decision made at the very top mm -hmm. that this had to happen. One of it was like prisoners are also human beings. Mm -hmm. They could have made mistakes. Some are innocently convicted. Mm -hmm. I was suffering a like lot of conviction, exactly. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we need to correct them and bring them out mm -hmm. to be productive members of the society. Mm -hmm. One of the most celebrated inmates in this, country, in this world mm -hmm. is Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. He was in prison for 27 years. That's right. No one wants to talk about the fact that he was jailed for terrorism. Right. Right? Right. But... By God's grace, he came out, he led his country. Mm -hmm. That was leadership. I mean, he kept the focus. Now, what I'm talking about here is, to a young person, prison is not the best of places. Mm. And don't forget the age of criminal culpability is nine years. Yes, that is So shocking. we have very young people in the children's institutions. Because, I mean, if a child has been in conflict with the law, Please, could you just, uh, and I, you, you have more to say, could you just explain that to our viewers? When you say that the age of cr criminal culpability, criminal responsibility, yeah. is eight, what, eight or nine? Nine. Nine. What does that mean? It means a nine-year-old can actually be charged for a crime? Exactly. That's why we have the children's court. Goodness. So a nine-year-old who commits a crime can actually be charged and then committed by the children court. Of course, the court considers the best interest of the okay, child. Okay. So the, the sentencing or the imprisonment of this child will be a last resort. But, but is, isn't that number uh, somewhat lower than, I imagine, compared it to could other be, countries? It could be, you could consider that until you meet a 10-year-old with a gun. Oh, wow. Then you'll have your second thoughts about wow. that. Wow, right. Yeah. Right. So th there's something about, about, it's not about age. It's mm -hmm. about how we've cultured the young people. Mm -hmm. What are we constantly exposing them to? Mm -hmm. And how does that affect them? Because going to prison, I can tell you one thing. I, I have this joke with my friends in the criminal justice system. The police can only keep you for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. with it, after 24 hours, they have to take you to court. Mm -hmm. Guys, right? you're okay. done. Okay. The prison officer mm -hmm. will be with you for the rest of that time. Right. These are the guys who have to walk that journey with you. They have uh -huh. to understand you. They have to help you reset. Uh -huh. 
and think positively so that when you get back home, yeah. you become a productive member of the society. Right. But how do we regard our prison officers? We regard them that those people who are on the other mm. side, we don't support right. them. Right. So many times you'll find even prison officers, and that's a support I need everyone to bring on board. Mm -hmm. Our prison officers, our police officers, mm -hmm. need mental health support mm. because they're dealing with trauma. They're dealing with traumatic, broken people. Exactly. Life every in prison. Every day. Every day. Every day. They wake up every day. That's their life. That's their JD. Uh, if you look at the young people, you asked me about the experience back Yes, there. please. Yes. Losing your freedom for one day, that's the worst punishment you'll ever get. Mm. So multiply it with the number of days or the number of hours or the number. Just taking away that freedom mm. means the world to practically everyone. Mm. So the moment you find yourself in that situation, because you could find that yourself in that situation, how do you handle it? There are many rehabilitative tools in the prison. Mm -hmm. There are schools right now, for example, the, the ones now we are talking about, the nine, 10 year olds, mm -hmm. when they go to the approved schools or the children's homes, for example, they can still go to school. Mm -hmm. You know, they're under the children's office and they'll still be taken care of and those who want to go to school can actually go to school. Mm -hmm. If you go to the girls' uh, Boston institution, mm -hmm. Boston institution hosts children between the age of 14 and 18. Mm -hmm. There's one for girls and two for boys. Mm -hmm. Shikusa Boston. In, in the whole country? In the whole country, the only three. Wow. So there's one for girls here in Kamiti, it's called Kamai Girls mm -hmm. Boston. And then there's Shik uh, Shikulatewa uh -huh. and Shikusa Shikusa in West. Yeah. Now these three take boys between the age of 14 and 18. Mm -hmm. They are sentenced to a maximum of three years mm -hmm. for different offenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, with good behavior, after one year, they can be released on license. Oh. And being released on license means they're being released under the care of the probation and aftercare department, mm -hmm. which does a great job. Mm -hmm. And then um, now even well wishes have come on board and they can support these kids. And I'm asking guys, I mean, these kids need our support. They need our mm. love. We know where they come from. Right. Not some of the best of places. Right. But they need our support because some of them are very bright. You know, you know, actually, on that point, um, let me uh, talk to us a little bit about the process of reintegration and maybe some of the gaps there and what solutions you could propose. Because I'm thinking, um, if somebody is coming back to the same community that produced them, perhaps a community that has the same pressures, push and pull, that actually created or availed the criminal element or enabled the criminal element in this person. Uh, this person is coming back, obviously with a different mindset. Talk to us about that process, uh, you know, of, of reintegrating back into society. Um, I read a, a particular report that was um, quite damning. It said uh, lots of people want to actually go back to prison because they feel unwelcome. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about where the I mean, I mean are. I'll tell you from my experience. Please. No one wants to go back to prison. Mm. Some of these reports are cliche. Mm. And sometimes I find them tailored to suit a certain narrative. Uh -huh. No one wants to go back to prison. No one. I can tell you that for free. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always been a mistake about, you know, someone who's been arrested, released on bail, then they commit another offense, or they're caught in one, two, three, they go back. And there's someone who served time, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, mm -hmm. those guys don't want to go back to jail. Mm -hmm. They've learned it, they know it. Mm -hmm. They want to start their lives afresh and rebuild it. Just like I said, most of them are young. Mm -hmm. Maybe some want to start their families and move on. Majority, as you talk about reintegration, for us at Crime Sipa, we have the Prison and Reintegration Project, mm -hmm. which uh, we call it Phoenix, rising up again. Right, from the ashes. Yeah, from the ashes. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? We don't call those who've come from prison ex-prisoners, ex-convicts. Mm -hmm. No, we call them returning citizens. Mm -hmm. They've been in a place, they're coming back, and they want to start their lives afresh. Mm -hmm. I can tell you one thing for free. These guys are very productive, mm -hmm. number one. Reintegration starts from the day you are arrested. Wow. The prisons department now have accepted it and they're working with partners to ensure that reintegration from the moment you're arrested. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't have connection with the family. Maybe there are things in the community that made you get into conflict with the law. Maybe you've been separated from your family. The reintegration process starts from day one. Mm -hmm. For us, our integration process, because we run programs in 16 prisons now, maybe 22 by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. The key thing for us is what's the connection between this person and the place they left. Mm -hmm. Most of the guys in prison didn't commit crimes in their homes if mm -hmm. they committed crimes. Mm -hmm. Not in, in their home areas, no. Some were very far. So basically the people at home have no issue with you. Some might not even know that you committed this crime. Right. So the key for us is when this person gets out, how ready are they? 
If I show you, if you get to our website, crimesipua.org, you'll see a story of David who left prison the other day after 20 years. Right. He's down in the village cleaning people off their jiggers. I mean, wow. you wouldn't expect someone who's gone through 20 years of wrongful conviction mm -hmm. to be serving the community, mentoring, wow. shaving guys who are mentally disturbed, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just doing the best that he could. Mm -hmm. These are people with a clean heart and they want right. to serve. So are we giving them the opportunity? What kind of support? They need support when they come out. Right. What kind of support systems do we have? Right. Sometimes it's not monetary, but just, I mean, churches are playing a big role. Friends are playing a big role now. Right. Families have accepted mm -hmm. and are, you know, helping uh, the family, the, the people pick up. But as you started by saying, most come from very poor families. Right. How do we help them pick right. up from the ashes? Wow, I'll tell you this. Um, this is a massive conversation. Um, we have had, I'm, I'm afraid, just it looks like the time we have is a drop in the ocean. But I'm glad we've been able to spark a conversation and I'm glad we've been able to actually give our audiences some insight. Pete, as we wind up, I'm actually completely out of time. Um, there's your camera. I'd like you to send a message to Kenyans from your heart. You've got a few seconds. There's your camera right there. Talk to Kenyans. For okay, you. dear Kenyans, I'm speaking to you from TV47 Studios. My name is Pete Oko from Crime Sipoa. We work with young people and we know they need your support. Crime is easy to eradicate in this country if we give everyone equal opportunity, equal chances, and also teach people the law. Many people actually break the law because they don't know the law. So at Crime Sipoa, what we decided to do, every Tuesday and Thursday, we are having online classes for free. Free legal awareness, you can join us, you can learn what we do, but above all, wherever you are, it's our duty. If people are breaking the law, if people are selling drugs in your community, it's for you to speak out. Our kids are suffering because of drugs, alcohol, abuse, and the people who are selling these things, we know them. You know, so, and also the people at the very right. top. Mm -hmm. The young people want to emulate you. It's the model that, how we are modeling our lives. If you are modeling our lives around integrity, they'll follow that. If we model our lives around things that actually the quick fixes, they'll follow that. It's our choice to right. know the kind of country we want. But the young people, you guys are leading this country right. and I support you fully. God bless absolutely, you. Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself and I will not. May the good Lord bless you. Have a good night and thank you for choosing us to inform you this evening on Daily Report and Insight tonight. Pete, we need to have you back again. Thank you, bro. Thank, thank you, you so much. Appreciate <laughs> you. God bless thank you. you very thank much. You. Good night, thank people. You. Thank, thank you. you. That was great.